I did not give you an outline of the lectures because I, for some reason I've been struggling this this term with figuring out exactly how I wanted to break these classes down, and this one probably as much as any. Um, but I think what I'll do, last week we did Introduction to Ethics and Introduction to Christian Ethics. Today, I want to talk about ethics, morality, and religion. Those are not all the same thing, but they obviously affect one another. And particularly, I'm going to look at those topics from a historical point of view. We're going to talk quite a bit today about the Greek philosophers, because ethics in any Western sense, including Christian ethics, is based upon two primary sources, the Greek philosophers, and that includes especially uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and then Jewish ethics, which actually came a long time before Greek, uh, Greek ethics, but those, those two things together uh, are really the foundation for Western ethical thinking. Um, a lot of people, if you, don't, if you know your history as a Greek philosopher, excuse me for telling you this, but you might not, a lot of people don't realize that Socrates, the one that everybody's heard of, um, well, they've heard of all three, but Socrates, is the, when people think Greek philosopher, Socrates or Plato, maybe the ones they think of first. Socrates was the teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. So there's a direct connection between those three, who were the three greatest of all the Greek philosophers, at least the ones that have continued to be read most often in, in the West. Aristotle's writings um, have continued to be read you know, since his day, which was uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, Aristotle's writings is still popular and basic to all Western philosophy or Western culture or anything else. Come in, that's all right, well, come on in, find a seat. We're, we're good. We're not that formal. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit today about those three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, because they really kind of lay the foundation for all of Western understanding about the, the issue of ethics. In the case of Socrates, the first of those three, and kind of the, the biggest light in all of Greek philosophy, we cannot read Socrates' writing uh, about his own beliefs because Socrates didn't write. In fact, Socrates openly opposed writing. He said that if people wrote, if they did writing, they would forget things. They would remember stuff. He believed in having it all in your head, of, of remembering everything you needed to know. And he said, people start writing things down, they're going to start forgetting it. And he was right. But what we have of Socrates' thought, we have through Plato, his student. Because Plato is the one who wrote Socrates' thoughts, etc. And then Plato then developed them into his own thoughts. In fact, some of the books, like the Republic, Plato's book, um, gets into, starts out talking about Socrates and Socrates' beliefs, and then Plato gets into his own ideas. So that one, that one work is especially important because the, the, the Republic gives us both Socrates and Plato. And then Aristotle is the great writer. Aristotle is the one who actually invented uh, the word ethics, or at least the first one to use it, whether it had been used in the sense we know it or not. Um, so we're going to get into that today. <laughs> I'm already giving you the lecture. Uh, but we, we want to, to study that, and, and to give you again a perspective, Socrates, the first of those great, three great Greek philosophers who dealt with the issues of ethics. Socrates and Plato dealt with ethical issues, although they didn't use the word ethics. Aristotle coined the word ethics. And the word politics, by the way. He thought those were the two great sort of moral um, imperatives for us, is how do we live together in society in a way that's productive, which he called politics. Politics doesn't just mean trying to get elected, it means how do you have an orderly society. And ethics, which is the personal version of that. How do you have a personal quality of life? How do you have a good life as a person, or which is ethics, or a good life as a society, which is politics. Um, so we're, we'll get into that, but to give you some perspective, Socrates, the first of those three, was he died in 399 BC. Well, Jewish ethics started you could say it started with Abraham, which is 2000 BC. It's 1600 years before that. In fact, if you've got Abraham and then Moses, the great lawgiver, who gave the Ten Commandments and really got us started on the whole, you know, ethical law thing in the Jewish, in the Jewish law, um, and then on through the prophets, the last of the Jewish prophets, Malachi, was alive at the same time as Socrates. So that gives you some perspective of how much older Jewish ethics is. But in terms of any, any real development of Jewish ethics, it really, Jewish ethics from the time of the Greek philosophers became a combination of Jewish law, 
and philosophical ethics from the Greeks. They merged those two together because after Alexander, who came uh, in, the, in the hundred years following those guys, uh, Aristotle was Alexander the Great's tutor. Did you know that? Uh, Aristotle was hired by, uh, by Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedonia, to come up to Macedonia and to teach his son. And so Aristotle the philosopher, that Aristotle, was the tutor for Alexander the Great. And so when Alexander the Great traveled throughout all the known world and conquered almost all of it and took Greek culture, he took the Greek language, he took Greek theater and Greek art and Greek sports, the whole of the Greek culture, he took along the Greek philosophers. And that included conquering the Holy Land, in the area we know as the Holy Land. So from that time on, 300 years prior to the time of Jesus, the Jews were heavily influenced by the Greek culture and Greek philosophy. And so from the, about the time, well, any time after Alexander, so we're talking 300 uh, BC, from that time on, Greek or Jewish ethics was a combination of Jewish law and Greek philosophy. <clears throat> In fact, it got to be so much Greek influence, the Hellenized Jews, as they're called. The Hellenized Jews were the Jews that were influenced by Greek culture. Hellas is the ancient name for Greece. So when you see Hellenized, it means influenced by Greece. The Hellenized Jews became so Hellenized, so Greek-oriented, many of them forgot how to read Hebrew. So much so that in the 200s BC, a bunch of scholars from Jerusalem were brought down to Alexandria, the Greek city that Alexander the Great founded. He founded over 20 cities and named all of them Alexandria. He had a couple of others, like he founded one in, in memory of his, his favorite horse, Persepolis. So that was, um, so he named one city after him. But most of them were named after him. There were cities named Alexandria all over the Middle East and Far East. And so he brought these scholars from Jerusalem down to Alexandria in order to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. That's what we call the Septuagint. Septuagint means the 70, because their, their historic traditionally was understood to be 70 Jewish scholars came from Jerusalem to Alexandria to translate the Hebrew scripture into Greek. They had to do that because so many of the Jews had gotten so Greekified, so Hellenized, they didn't even know how to read their own scripture anymore. They couldn't read Hebrew. And so they had to have a Greek version in order to be able to read their own holy writings. And that's what the Septuagint is. And some of the materials that were used to translate the Septuagint from Hebrew into Greek, we no longer have access to those. You know, they went away. And so in some ways, the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, is one of our very oldest versions of the Hebrew Bible. Because the, 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 the materials they used to translate it were, some of them were older than the, the oldest extant things that we have now. Okay. That's all, that's, that's the first sermon. We'll get into some more. So next week we're going to look at biblical and theological ethics. We will dig more deeply into scripture. What does the Bible say? Both the Old Testament in order to understand Old Testament ethics and the New Testament in order to understand Christian ethics. Because you know, we are heirs to the Old Testament. And one of the challenges is how do we look at Old Testament law, which was the basis, that's the foundation of Jewish ethics, primary, <clears throat> the primary basis, and how do we understand that in terms of what Jesus said and what the New Testament meant? We then are going to talk about the three, each week, one of each of the three great um, approaches to ethics. The first one, duty ethics, or deontology, and we'll have Catherine speak since she demonstrated last week that she is the ultimate deontologist. I think I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I'm just teasing you. I'm just teasing you. Um, deontology means duty ethics. And so, for instance, for the Jews, they are first very much deontological because they start out with a law. God said, do this, don't do this. There's a law, there's a rule. We have a duty to obey the law. But then they get into issues, we'll talk about that a little bit today, of what if you've got a situation that you don't have an exact law to address? It? How do you then adapt that? And so Jewish ethics is more complicated than just reading the 613 commandments that exist in the Old Testament. But duty ethics, the ontology we'll talk about, and then goal ethics. This is um, technically called consequentialism, which means that you, your ethical decision should be based upon the results, 
Um, one version of, of the consequentialism is called utilitarianism, which says, what will produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people? And you get into questions about what is good. But that's a different approach. Then, we're going to talk about virtue ethics. Today I'm going to get into the fact that virtue ethics, although we'll talk about it third because it's not as common today, it actually is the most ancient approach to ethics. It's what the Greeks were involved in. Um, well, in terms of Western philosophy, it's the oldest. The Hebrew duty ethics or law ethics came before that, but virtue ethics affected it. On November 12th, we'll talk about Christian ethics and modern society. One of the real challenges we've had in the last 50 to 100 years is we come up with a whole new list of ethical problems. Before we had nuclear weapons, the issue of what constitutes a, a you know, justified war was a very different question. Before we had um, in vitro fertilization, before we had the potential to clone, before all of this stuff that has come along in recent years uh, have created a whole new department of ethical questions. And so when we talk about modern society, we, part of what we'll be talking about is how we apply Christian ethics to our lives, but especially how do we apply it to things that didn't exist when the Old Testament and New Testament were written. How do we adapt? And then we'll have a conclusion and the final exam. Yeah. As, what's that? Exam. Exam, yes. If, you don't have to take the exam unless you are taking this class for credit. If you're doing it for certificate, or for um, a degree, then you must take the exam and make a passing grade of 65 or more. But, again, for those of you who may not have been here, uh, around the fifth week, fifth or sixth week, since it's an eight-week class, I will give you a document that is what you need to know from Christian Ethics. And it will be everything laid out for you in terms of here's what you need to know. The test will not have anything on it that's not on that document. I do that primarily because I think the goal here is for you to learn this stuff. And so that, for me, is the best way for people to learn it. I, people who take the test, I think that's true, isn't it? You agree with that? And do you agree that you won't be asked anything on a test that's not on that document, right? Okay. Um, so, I recommend that even if you're not doing this for credit, that you do study and take the test, because that is perhaps the best way to learn. That's the reason why, historically, not just because you have a mean teacher, but the reason that you do study and test is because that's a way to lock it in. That's a way to make sure you understand stuff. So I recommend that you do that, but it is not required if you're not taking this for a certificate or a degree. Okay? But I will tell you everything you need to know before we get to that point. So the last week, the first hour, will be sort of concluding remarks and then we will have an hour for the exam, okay? All right, a uh, couple of slides in, in topics that we got into last week, but I want to restate because they're foundational what we're gonna go into here. Ethics, or sometimes it's referred to as moral theology. I'm sorry, what did I say, theology? Okay, I'm, I'm showing my bias here. Moral philosophy, uh, I'm a philosophical theologian, that's how I think of myself. So, is the branch of philosophy that deals with determining the proper course of action for us. And then, in systematizing, organizing, defending, recommending certain concepts of right and wrong behavior. Now, there's three different categories within that. There is meta-ethics, which is the sort of philosophical principles, um, the philosophy behind ethics. What, what is it? You know, how does it work? What, what's the history of it? Um, what's the philosophy behind it? It is, meta-ethics is the furthest thing from any kind of practical application. Meta-ethics, the philosophy part, does not tell you how to decide what's right and wrong in a given situation. And typically, the first half of the 20th century, well, up prior to the Second World War, almost everybody was focusing on meta-ethics because we thought so well of ourselves, we thought we'd just sit around and think about this stuff. We didn't have to worry about actually doing anything. Um, but there is a place for that. Then normative ethics is what principles or, or sort of a general approaches might we apply to making ethical decisions. That's where you get into the ontology or duty ethics, into um, the virtue ethics, which has to do with being a good person, what, what constitutes being a, a good person, um, and the, um, ah, just to, uh, consequentialism, making a decision based upon what the results will be, which some people, you know, negatively have referred to as situational ethics. That what is right or wrong is based upon the situation. That there's no 
ultimate right or wrong. We're going to talk about all that. But the, that's normative ethics. Those are the sort of systematic ways you can approach actually making decisions. And then there's applied ethics. Given any specific circumstance, how do you decide what you should do or should not do? So metaethics is the philosophy. Normative ethics are the sort of systems that you might follow. You know, either obedience to duty or law, or deciding based upon what the consequences are going to be, or deciding based upon who you should be. Virtue ethics. And then applied ethics is how do you make a decision right now about this thing? Should I kick this dog or not? Okay. Um, so it is the study of the best way for people to live. In fact, we're going to talk about the Greek philosophers here in a few minutes. And they pretty much universally approached it from the point of view of the issue of happiness. And when they said happiness, they did, didn't mean, no, I like, you know, I like yellow or whatever. They meant, how do you achieve a good life? You know, what does it mean to have a good life? And does it involve um, simply trying to find something that's pleasurable? Is a good life, like the Epicurean said, the, to achieve as much pleasure and as little pain as possible? Or is it something more, you know, is it something more complex than that? Is it, does a good life involve, when appropriate, sacrificing yourself for some greater good? Is that really a good life? And if, you're, you know, if your definition of good life is how do, you, um, how do you get the most pleasure and the least pain, are you prepared to sacrifice other people's best interests for that? You know, to abuse people, to you know, whatever? Um, so the issue of what's the best way for people to live, how do you have a good life, and then what actions are right or wrong in any particular circumstance in order to achieve that? Always it comes back, as we'll talk in a minute, about what constitutes good? What is a good life? That is, as much as anything else, the crux question for ethics. What constitutes good? Now, in the process of being a field of study, ethics gets into defining concepts like good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and vice, crime and justice. Um, and not every ethical philosopher, be they Greek or Jewish or Christian, agrees on all those definitions, which is why they still talk about it. You know, if we'd sorted all this stuff out and everybody agreed, then there would be something for us still to talk about. It's also, as we talked about last week, um, true that every single person is an ethicist. Every one of us. We cannot keep from having to make decisions on our course of action every day. You know, what's right or what's wrong? Should I buy that car I really like, which is a gas guzzler and, you know, is going to really going to harm the planet, or do I buy the one I don't like as much because it's going to be more economical? You know, I really want that fourth piece of chocolate cake. Should I do it? Especially since there are two other people at the table who want it. Okay, what's right about that? There's no joke about which, which constitutes, I think, an ethical decision. In the South, it's considered, I'm from the South, it's considered impolite to eat the last piece of whatever. Okay, and so you'll often see one piece of chicken left on the plate, or one piece of cake left, you know, well, the story is that the family's all sitting around and there's one piece of chicken left, left, fried chicken, and everybody's eyeing it, everybody's looking at it. All of a sudden, the lights go on. And there's a loud scream. And the lights come back on, and there's Grandpa with six forks in the back of his hand. <laughs> well, they made an ethical decision. All of them said, it's not right for me to take that while everybody can see me, but as soon as the lights went out, they decided it was okay. So we, my point is, we make ethical decisions all the time of one kind or another. And we can't keep from that. So we are all ethicists. I think it is helpful to us, especially, this, this course is for everybody, it's for anybody. But this, this comes under the category of Christian leadership in, in our, because we have different categories. We have Old Testament, New Testament, theology, Christian maturity, Christian leadership. This is called a Christian leadership course because it's not just for you, but each of you by being in here. Um, hopefully we will equip you not only to help make ethical decisions for yourself, good ethical decisions, because it's also possible to make bad ethical decisions. You know, um, the Nazis in the Second World War made a lot of ethical decisions, most of them bad ones. Okay? So um, we all make, uh, make ethical decisions, but this class hopefully will give you some sort of uh, understanding that will help you be a leader in helping other people make ethical decisions. That's why it's listed under Christian leadership as a, a category. All right? So, the philosophy of ethics deals with, ultimately, what is right, what is good. If it has to do with the pursuit of a good life, 
which everyone wants. Who doesn't want to have a good life? But what does that mean? Um, the difficulty we face is to discern what course of action is best, what constitutes a good life, what is good in life. So how do we discern moral truth? What principles are there to guide us in moral decision making? Or is there even such a thing as moral truth? We're going to touch on that a little bit today. We'll talk about it more later. The, tomorrow afternoon we have our Apologetics 2 response to the New Atheists. Well, one of the biggest challenges the New Atheists have faced, and they have not responded uh, convincingly to it, is if you believe there is no God, if you believe there is nothing supernatural, if you believe there is nothing beyond the physical world, then from whence do we get moral motivation? Where does morality come from? What is it that causes people universally to believe that some things are good and some things are bad. We simply are pieces of meat that's happened to be at the top of the, of the, you know, the feeding chain. Where does morality come from? And they've really struggled with that, and some of the evolutionary uh, atheists have come up with ideas about that morality is simply a very sophisticated level of survival. You know, that it all fits into the survival of the fittest because if I didn't do something to show my concern for you and be good to you, then you're liable to kill me. And so I'm, you know, I'm part of a group, and I want the best for the group, and I want the best for the individuals in the group, because otherwise the group dies. Their arguments are not very convincing compared to the fact that we, we have, you know, we've never had a society ever in history that does not have religion of some kind, a belief in the supernatural of some kind. And we have never had people who did not have some sense of morals. When they say, for instance, some people would say that, well, morals are entirely um, based upon what community you live in. They're entirely cultural. They're culturally uh, determined. But, it, and there's some truth to that, up to a certain point. Uh, and you could say, well, there are people who are cannibals, and they believe in eating other people, and that's their culture, so for them that's not wrong. But interestingly enough, no cannibal culture has ever been found who thought it was okay to eat your own children. So, we're, you know, there are certain levels, certain points beyond which no culture has ever been willing to go with regard to moral decision making. In fact, we have special names in psychology, not moral psychology, for anybody who does not have an inherent sense of moral right and wrong. They're called sociopaths. It is considered a very serious kind of mental illness. The inability to determine what is right and what is wrong to, to any kind of acceptable standard is con constitutes one of the most severe of all mental illnesses, sociopath. So the idea of there being moral truth, where does that come from? Is there really something called morality that is objective and not just subjective, meaning it is outside of us, it's not something we decide inside of us? Um, is it just a matter of opinion or emotions? Because <laughs> the atheistic moral relativists that is, the people who think that morality is relevant, relative to your situation or your culture or what, what's best for you and it's a survival instinct, then ultimately nothing is really right or wrong. You know, we, are, we cannot appropriately ever evaluate something as being right, truly right or truly wrong. We can't say it's wrong to eat your own children, ultimately. If perhaps somebody decided, that's going to make me stronger, that's going to make me more fit, I have the power to do it. You see my point? So those are very serious questions. Those are meta-ethical questions. Those are kind of philosophical questions at the base of uh, ethics. And then, related to that, on the other side of the coin, what role does religious belief properly play in ethics? Later on today, I'll talk about, very briefly, some of the different kind of ethical standards that come in religious, different re major religious systems in the world. Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Islam, Hinduism, um, Christianity, we'll get into a lot. Judaism, I'm going to talk about before that. But they all have some source from which they draw their sense of what is ethical. Alright? Now, the philosophy of ethics seeks to confront the need to find a connection between ethical theory and ethical practice. In fact, I'm going to talk later, there's two primary criteria that an ethical system has to fulfill. One of them is, it has to not have internal contradictions. In other words, there has to be a principle of consistency within it. You can't profess two things that are contrary to one another. And the second thing is, there has to be some sense of practicality to it. It has to be applicable. One of the difficulties that we run into with ancient Greek ethics, and which is reflected in virtue ethics primarily, the idea that the goal in ethics is to be a good person, 
to be the best person you can be. One of the problems with that is that can sometimes that's not very helpful when you get to an actual actually making an ethical decision about to do something or not to do something. So there's a point of practical application that you run into problems when you look at the Greek ethics or you look into virtue ethics. It doesn't mean it's not valid, but by itself, it tends to fail in one of the two major criteria of being internally consistent and being applicable in some way. That it helps you make moral decisions. Does that make sense? You all do know you can ask questions, or you can stop me if I'm not being clear about something. Always. We're not, we're not standing on ceremony here. Well, I want to get into that topic, the ancient ethics and modern issues right now a little bit. And it's interesting that whenever you're speaking of ancient ethical systems, whether it be Jewish, which is the oldest of the ethical systems, in fact, Judaism was the first example we have of what's called ethical monotheism. The Jewish faith is the first time ever that a religion had a very clear ethical motivation. Prior to that, there was, there was much more a sense of, if it works, you're okay. In fact, in the very oldest of human writings, the epic poems like the Mesopotamian um, Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Homer's Iliad, the Eddas in Iceland, uh, which were ancient writings, almost all of them represent, and, and you could go back, the ancient Norse mythologies um, and various other ancient stories about gods and heroes. You know, that's the, all of the ancient writings are about gods and heroes, whether it be Homer or or the Gilgamesh epic, or any of the ancient writings, most ancient writings. Well, in the great hero epics, the heroes or the gods, the, the ethical value that they represent are the values like valor, bravery, and success. None of those ancient writings really have any sort of um, moral considerations, as we think of them. For instance, if a, if a hero or a god were a great leader, and powerful and won the day for their people, either the tribe that they were a leader of or the people that worshipped them, then it didn't matter how they did it. They were considered that that was the highest value, that was the highest ethic, is they were great leaders. They were successful. They were brave. They represented strength. That was the moral values. There was no sense in which the fact that they killed a whole lot of people to do it was in any way a problem. Okay? If you won and you were noble, that's all that was required. Judaism comes along 4,000 years ago. Abraham is 2,000 BC, so that's the start of the Hebrew people. Abraham comes along, and then everything after Abraham, down to Moses 500 years later, and all the prophets after that, they introduce the idea that some things are simply right and some things are wrong. It's not just a matter of if you're strong enough or if you're a great leader, you can win. And that's all, that's valor and strength and victory is all that matters. That's why Judaism was a fundamental change in the way people understood ethics. Being noble and strong, a hero who won victories was no longer the ultimate goal. Make sense? So that's why Judaism comes along and it is a, a very different kind of approach to ethics. But when we talk about ancient ethics, either Judaism or Greek ethics, you know, anything really before Jesus, we don't talk about ancient morality. We talk about ancient ethics. When we talk about modern times, we may say modern ethics, but more often we will talk, the, 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 the scholars in this field talk about modern morality. So we need to have a little bit of different sense, both of what the ancient and modern approaches, in order to understand it. Satyana, great historical philosopher, said those who do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. So we need to know some of the history, and that gives us a foundation of understanding from which we can understand our modern Christian ethics. So, what is ancient, modern, what are the different approaches? What is the difference in ethics and morality? Because there is a difference. They often, in modern times, especially in lay writings, not philosophical writing, they may be used interchangeably. Ethics and morality may be used interchangeably, but technically there's a difference. In ancient times, when we talk about ancient ethics, ancient ethics were very much agent-centered, meaning the person was the focus. That was true even before Jewish monotheism. The hero, the god, and what they did, the focus was on the person who was doing it, the agent. So they were agent-centered. Still, there was a sense in living the good life versus good action. You know, the great heroes and the great gods in the ancient uh, epics, 
if they won the day for their people and they created a great society and they ended up being top dog, then that was considered a good life to them, no matter how many people had, whose necks they had to step on in order to get there. Okay. There's not a justification for their actions. If they won, then they must have been in the right sort of thing. Right, they, except... They, the Jewish people had that, if you were successful economically, then you had God's favor sort of thing. Well, to some extent, but to a great extent, they sort of turned that around and said, if God favors you, then you will be successful. See now, and what you just said is very true, but what you just said is an entirely modern thing to say, that that was self-justification. They didn't see there being any other option, if, that the great heroes and the great gods, they were the good guys. But then a cripple would be somehow disfavored. Right, by exactly. As well. And, and so, then we have examples, you know, um, Mephibosheth in the Old Testament was crippled and was cared for by David since he was the son of, you know, the son of Saul, and, and you get into all sorts of things like that. But, See, we look at it from a much more um, consequentialist or that sort of viewpoint. To them, that was morality, is if you were the leader and you were successful in leading your people to victory. Nothing else was really ethically considered, so it was the agent. And later on, with the Greeks, they got into the question of achieving happiness through virtue. That is, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit under Socrates and Aristotle especially, that virtue, arete in, um, in was to, uh, Aristotle says that that was the active part of the psyche, that that was the active part of the soul, was virtue. And so, the question of moral ought, they did not have a strong emphasis on the what you ought to do, but rather what you could do, or should do in favor, in, in, for the benefit of your people. Okay. So they had a very different age centered it was what the person, now, much of that comes down to this virtue ethics. In other words, the question is, what is the person like, or what will they be like if they do a certain thing? How will this affect them? Aristotle said, doing evil hurts your soul. So this was an ancient ethics, and it was very much a virtue ethics. What will it mean about you? I used the example last week. We still have that today, and I think very critically so, especially as Christians, we need to think about that. We'll get into it. Uh, but when the issue, when the question of torture of uh, accused terrorists, you know, at, at Gitmo or at Abu Ghraib prison or whatever came up, and John McCain, who was a candidate for president of the United States, when they asked him what he thought about torture, he said absolutely not. And they said, but these are awful people. They've done, you know, people we know have done terrible things or are planning terrible things. If we torture them, we might get information that keeps it from happening again. Notice that's a very consequentialist idea, that it's the consequences that will result, not what you actually do. And John McCain gave a very virtue ethics answer. He said, the question is not about who they are, what they've done, what they might do. The question is not who they are, it's who we are. That is a perfect summing up of virtue ethics. It's about the agent, the person doing it, more than the consequences. And that is the most ancient kind of approach. It goes all the way back to the ancient gods and hero stories and is reflected in, uh, up through the Greek philosophers. Okay, make sense? Okay. But then when we get into modern times, modern morality is very much more action-centered. It's less about who the person is, either that causes them to do something or because of what they did, and much more about what you do. Instead of virtue ethics, which is the ancient version, we get into questions of achieving the greatest good. Your actions will achieve the greatest good. This is consequentialism. Or that we are acting out of duty to a law, to a norm, to common decency, which is a kind of uh, deontology, deontologicalism. So those two ideas came much later, that we could make ethical decisions not based upon the person, but rather upon what the what the actions are going to result in, or what the actions are based on. Does that make sense? Very different. Now, I'm going to be advocating later on that a proper Christian ethic has to be all three. You know, we have rules. God has told us certain things are right and certain things are wrong. That's very deontological. We have to be concerned about the well-being of the people that are involved. That is consequentialism. We do what it is loving to people because we care about them and the consequences to them. So that's where you get into challenges. I want to obey the law, but I have to decide, is obeying the law really going to end up hurting people? And how do I deal with that? 
and in fact, that's a good question because when you look at the Old Testament law, you know, um, if, a, if a child is disobedient to the parents, they should be stoned to death. That's, what, that's in the Old Testament law. Do we do that anymore? No. We have because we believe that that action, the negative consequences of that, of showing, not showing love both to that person and also to, how, to our witness, the consequences are too negative for us to be obedient to that law. And Jesus came along and modified that law. Okay? The interpretation of the Old Testament, the Old Testament is still God's word to us, but we have a different way of looking at it because of Jesus. And, so, and some of that is, what are the results going to be? What's the consequentialism? And then we also have the issue of, we are called to be virtuous. You know, it does have an effect on our soul. If you do evil, it will affect you. You know, I see that in my own life. When I'm being disobedient to God, I find myself feeling less in touch with Him and more inclined to do bad stuff in the future. Right? Is that not true? So virtue ethics is true too. And I think what we're going to get to is an understanding that it, for our Christian ethics, it's a little bit of all three of those. But we need to understand them in order to understand how the various aspects of that apply. Okay? Now, so that's uh, ancient and modern. Ancient is much more virtue ethics. That is the agent-centered it has to do with the person, where they're coming from, and what it will do to them. Modern is more action-centered, what will achieve the greatest good, or based on what are we acting in obedience to, what law, what duty, what norm. Now, at the same time, ethics and morality, and I tell you this because you may run into different uses of those words. I don't remember seeing that in either the Moral Quest or in uh, Len Staffan's book, but you might run into it. Historically, ethics has been considered the pursuit of happiness or well-being via private lifestyle. That is, how should we live to make good lives for ourselves? That's why ethics was quoted by, that, that's very much a Greek kind of approach, and that's why ethics is a word the Greeks <coughs> created. It's based upon a Greek root. Morality, on the other hand, has more to do with other people's interests, and the constraints put on us by law and duty because of other people's interests. So another way to say that is, ethics are the underlying principles. Morality is what you do in order to try to be ethical. Right? Does that make sense? Ethics are the underlying principles, and that has to do with what system are you following. Do you rely more on a deontological system of ethics, or you know, what normative approach, or a consequentialist, or a virtue ethics kind of approach? That, those are ethics issues. That's the principles behind these it. These are very different. These, these are so different. I see that if one is to be happy, the other is what's best for, for everybody. Well, but, so it one's on the person, right? Exactly. Well, the ethics, again, that's why virtue ethics, the agent, the focus on the person doing it. Um, in one, you could look, if you read Socrates or especially Aristotle on this stuff, it looks very me-centered because they're focused on what is what in me do I need to focus on in order to make me virtuous, in order to give me a good life, and what constitutes a good life. Now, that has ramifications on how I act. In fact, Aristotle makes a very specific point of saying it's not just mental, it's not just on the inside, but you have to deal with that in order then to be able to decide how you treat other people. And in fact, Aristotle was a little different than Socrates and Plato in terms of saying how you treat other people. What you actually do with this does make a difference. Prior to that, it was just how do you become the best person you can be? How do you become, uh, how do you gain a good life? How do you have virtue in your life? It's all about me in the early so they ancient very different, then. Well, the ethics are still the principles. See, some of the principles the Greek talked about, if we add to the virtue ethics, you know, what is, what, what kind of person do I need to be? If we add to that, well, based on what? That's the duty ethics. And then, what do I do with that? In, in a much more specific, you know, an outgoing way, which is consequentialist. How do I, how do I treat other people, and what are going to be the results of that? Would the Greek say that based on that, that how you treat other people has to do with your own happiness? It's what's going to bring Correct. you the most happiness. Well, and, and it has to do too. Um, we're going to talk about. Um, the words that the Greeks use, which we translate happiness, that's probably a really bad translation, but we don't have the right word for it. Um, I'll get into that in a minute when I talk about Aristotle, for instance. The word that he used is probably not well translated happiness, although it often is. It means more well-being, or fulfillment, or completion. So it's a much bigger deal. Um, it's more like the difference we, we often, as Christians, would draw between happiness and joy. Not based upon circumstances. It's a deeper abide. Joy is a deeper abiding thing. It's not just happy. 
It's a, it's a deeper, longer, and can, can last even in bad, circles, bad situations. Even in painful situations, you can have joy, but it may not be happy. Okay. So while happiness is the word that's often used, which is why I use it, they're really talking about something much deeper than that. And when they talk about a good life, they recognize, Aristotle recognized the fact that to some people a good life, like with the Epicureans, means as much pleasure as possible, as little pain as possible, no matter what happens to other people. But Aristotle and the other Greek philosophers, the good ones, um, Plato was a little loose here, uh, but Socrates and Aristotle on the other side of them would say that it's not just having a good life, meaning a lot of pleasure and not, not much pain, but rather a quality of life. You know, that you are noble. And again, that goes back to some of the ancient you know, heroes in, in God's stories. What is noble in your life? What is worthwhile in your life? A good life is a life that is worthwhile. Aristotle would say that it is a life that is um, where you have exceeded what might have been seen as your limitations, that you have excelled in your life. A life of excellence is a good life. And that includes a virtuous life, a life where you're making decisions that are based upon trying to be the best quality person ethically that you can be. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll get into, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But the principle is that everybody wants to have a good life. Um, and we're talking about positive goals, the directions we set for our life, what kind of person we think we ought to be. We're not referring to a good life as just being, getting all lots of toys and stuff. Right? That's the Western concept. Actually, there have been people like the Epicureans and others that uh, the hedonists, hedonism, by the way, we use that word meaning somebody who's just greedy for pleasure. The hedonism was actually a Greek school of philosophy, um, which was focused on, even more than the Epicureans, Increasing pleasure and decreasing pain. So we we use some of those words. An Epicurean is somebody who really likes the finer things in life, right? Or they just like to eat. Well, that, no, that's only one part of it. Well, we use the word Epicurean, especially to talk about people who love good food. It was a whole school of philosophy, and it was everything in terms of getting the very best. Hedonists were even more more callous than that. You know, that was give me all the pleasure I can get and not any pain. And we use the word hedonism to mean exactly that these days. But they were schools of philosophy at that time. Um, when we're talking about goodness in the sense of ethical goodness, we're not just talking about having enough money to buy anything we want, enjoy our lives, and the heck with everybody else. That's not a good life. And I think if you think about it for just a minute, we all know that's not a good life. And yet, not since the time of the hedonists, as, as, philo as uh, philosophical hedonism, as a culture, had more of an orientation toward getting as much money and as much pleasure and as much stuff as possible as we have. Okay. Um, this is a real issue for us. People, many people in our culture think a good life is a lot of money, a lot of free time, a lot of toys, free to do whatever I want. Well, that's not a good life in any ethical sense of it. What do you do with that? And that's certainly not a good life in terms of any biblical sense, either Jewish ethics or Christian ethics. And you're right, the Jews believed that wealth in your life was a sign of God's blessing. But they still were expected to use it in the right way. You know, there was a sense of, and I'm talking about some of the ethical principles of Judaism in a minute, they were expected to take care of the widows and orphans. They were expected to show loving kindness, or chesed, um, as it is in the word in Hebrew. So they were expected to use it in the right way, even though they believed that that was a sign of God's blessing. It wasn't just about them getting stuff. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Interestingly, down through history, well, I was talking about the gods and heroes, you know, Homer and, and uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, etc. Those were written about gods and heroes, and they were intended, for one thing, only the very wealthy people, only the rulers and the priests, etc., could even read. And so that was included, those were intended for the highest level of society. And it was always about gods and heroes and being a good leader and leading your people well. When you, there are a few ancient documents, like the instruction of uh, Amenhotep, or the Sumerian Farmer's Almanac, believe it or not, they did have a document called the Farmer's Almanac, which was intended, while it would be read by the priests, because common people couldn't read it, it referred more to the local people, small, smaller people, you know, the people who were farmers and workers and things. They tended to have a little bit more of what we would recognize as an ethical approach, not just being noble and strong and winning the victory, okay, being brave. Um, and if you, the perfect examples of those are the Nordic stories, you know, the, the Norse gods, Thor, and, you know, all of those kind of things. Uh, but these 
ancient writings that were intended more for the lower classes of society would say things like, farmers should always leave some grain in their fields so that the poor can come and glean their fields. And the gleaning is to go behind and pick out whatever's left to eat. The story of Esther. Esther meets her future husband because she's gleaning the field because she and her mother-in-law are poor. I think you're talking about Ruth. Or Ruth. I'm sorry, not Esther. Ruth. Yeah. Um, you know. uh, Ruth, Ruth meets Boaz eventually because, yeah, thank you, um, meets Boaz because she's gleaning the field because she and her mother-in-law are very, very poor and they're hungry. And that's how she ends up meeting her, uh, who actually is a relative of her mother-in-law's. And so... That was a typical thing. The Jews maintained the same thing. But some of the other ancient writings would say, take care of the poor people, at least passively, even if not actively. Give them a chance. And that was an ethical statement. Those weren't in the writings about gods and heroes, but they were in sort of common, some of common people references. It's also true that there were quite a few versions of what we call the golden rule. You know the golden rule. It's not he who has the most golden rules, which is what some people they say. The golden rule, uh, as we know it, the biblical version, Jesus said, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Interestingly, in ancient times, there are a number of different uh, times the golden rule is, is presented, but it's almost always presented in the negative. Don't do to other people what you don't want to have done to you. Okay. But that existed with a lot of people back then. Um, what time are we getting to? I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more and then we'll take a break and come back. The... Get with some of this stuff because I just start talking and start wondering. Uh, the ethics and morality, the difference between those two, again, I talked to about them here. There's a number of different ways in, people, in which people understand those, the, the relative relationship uh, between the relative relationship. That's, the thing. That's repetitiously kind of. um, Ethics and morality, there, some people have seen them as distinct spheres. You know, that ethics are the principles you do, and morality is what you actually do, and seen them as different things. Some people have seen them as been two halves of the same thing. First you have to decide what's the right thing to do, and you have to do it. But one of them is not complete without the other. Some of them have seen morality, the action, as being part inside of ethics. It's one lobe of ethics. And some have seen um, that, that it's a cause and effect, that the ethics causes morality uh, one way or another. So you, we get very different kinds of understanding of the relationship. The principle I would want you to remember is and we often, as I say, in modern times, people often use them interchangeably. But ethics are the principles. Morality is the action. Right? That's the way you need to understand it. You need to have a... And we, we actually use terms like, we'll say, he has a really good work ethic. Right? What we mean by that, he's, he has a good approach to it. He has a good philosophy of working. He has a good understanding of what he should be doing. <laughs> apart from what he actually does. His work being good. Okay, let's take a break. I've got about five minutes still. Let's come back in about five minutes after, and we'll start talking about some of the ancient ethical kind of foundations. All right, I want to spend a few minutes now talking about the ancient Greek philosophers, because as I said, Western ethical morality, to use those two words together, that is both the philosophical system that we sort of work under, and also how, what direction we take in terms of the morality, our actions, are based on the combination of ancient Jewish ethics and Greek ethical uh, philosophy. Now, I'm going to start with the Greeks, even though they came later. The Jewish ethics go back 1,600 years earlier, but our Western mindset, we actually are more, more oriented toward Greek thinking. You know, the Greeks, the Greek philosophy, the Greek governmental system, everything else that we have in the West today came from Greece. And so I'm going to talk about these first, and to give you sort of an idea, and then we're going to talk about the, the, the Jewish influence. Even, even the Jews were heavily influenced by Greek philosophy after the Greeks came along and Alexander swept through the whole known world, right? Um, first, as I said earlier, when we're talking about the ancient hero ethics, or the early stories of the gods, whether they be Icelandic, which are some of the oldest, or Nordic, or even some of the Greek stories, like Homer's um, Odyssey and Iliad, they have to do with heroes, or gods, who were the heroes in many cases, attaining what in Greek is called doxa, which means glory. Their ethical system was based upon the idea that these people, um, like the 
Homer's writing to you, you get Odysseus, or you, you get other major heroes that would go beyond what would be perceived as their original possibilities in order to win great victories and gain glory. In fact, they have a great word for going beyond one's possibilities, which is hybris. So this was the kind of folk ethical approach that was taken in, in, in Homer, Greek tragedy. It's reflected in Aesop's fables, uh, for instance, some of the stories that are kind of ethical in their orientation have to do with people gaining glory, great victory, right? Um, these early kind of ethical theories in Greek history predates philosophy, Greek philosophy. So the very earliest stories had to do with this gaining of glory from heroes and gods. Um, as Greek philosophy comes along, they develop an ethical category, the earliest versions of it, had to do with, I mentioned this earlier, with the gaining of virtue, or arete is the Greek word for it, which is strength or ability or force toward a goal. That's, that was their definition of virtue. You know, it was application of uh, force in a direction or having strength or ability. And later on, obviously, virtue has a different meaning for us today. But that's what they mean by it. The earliest of the Greek philosophers, who were referred to as the pre-Socratics, Socrates was the sort of turning point of Greek philosophy. And it's funny, the two probably most significant of ancient of philosophers in history, I'm going to talk about both today, one is Socrates. Even more important, really, than Aristotle, or Aristotle wrote, you know, we have his writings, and his writings are still being read. Aristotle reflected his being trained by Plato, and Plato reflected his being trained by Socrates, so Socrates is the source. So it's Socrates, and then later on, Kant, the modern German philosopher. And most philosophers today would tell you that modern philosophy is broken up into two categories, before Kant and after Kant. And Kant wrote a lot about ethics, we'll talk about that. But before Socrates, even, there were Greek philosophers that talked about ethical issues. They didn't use the word ethics, Aristotle pointed out. But you have people like Heraclitus. Heraclitus said that justice or injustice is entirely what people decide. There's no such thing as, a, as an absolute right or wrong. And we hear that echo today. Heraclitus said that people, human beings, decide what's right or wrong. It's what's in the eyes of the people. For every individual person, whether something is just or unjust, is based upon it's their subjective. Exactly, it's it's a, a subjective approach to it. Um, Pythagoras, you guys have heard of Pythagoras and his mathematical formulas. I, you probably didn't know Pythagoras was a very interesting guy. Pythagoras founded a cult sect, you might say, um, and that they believed in reincarnation and they thought you would achieve reincarnation by following certain ascetic practices, you know, denying yourself. One of the things they believed in doing was eating a lot of beans. Have you heard this? Uh, <laughs> beans. beans, beans. And the reason was frijoles, because ah. that he believed, Pythagoras believed, and all his followers believed, that when you had gas and you release gas from your body, you actually were releasing part of your spirit, and it would ascend to the heavens and be merged with the great. Well, you know, but the that's great because Greek Coke, I mean, when I was in Chiapas, they drink Coke that was a birth in the, in the church there. Coke bottles all over. I thought, well, why are they drinking? It's because that he's supposed to be going, taking their prayers. I'm oh, sorry. Taking I had not heard that. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Pythagoras yeah. believed yeah. that about, about flatulence. So, <laughs> and then, you know, one of the happiest of the pre socratic philosophers was Democritus. Democritus proposed that the supreme goal of life was cheerfulness. I like that. You know, Democritus believed in cheerfulness as the ultimate goal. Now, all of these were really were aspects of what later it was called ethics in terms of how should we act, what did, you know, how should we respond to the situations of life. Now, um, along the way you also get people like uh, Protagoras who was one of the sophists. The soph sophistry is considered a negative word now. It again was a philosophical movement. The sophists, it's based on the word Sophia which means wisdom, were like itinerant teachers. They would travel around and teach various things. Uh, Protagoras, one, Protagoras was one of the most famous of the sophist uh, teachers, and he formulated the first version of relativism, meaning um, he's the one who quoted, man is the measure of all things. Right? That there is no absolute, there is nothing above us, it's, you know, man is the point, humanity is the point, everything is relative beyond that. So, and that has carried down with being a primary plank in modern Western thinking. So, and that goes all the way back to, you know, 500, almost 500 BC, 
But then we come to really the people we want to talk about. Those were all sort of precursors. They were pre-Socratic. Socrates comes along. Socrates focused on the pursuit of and the love of goodness itself. We talked, he talked about good life, but he said it is the form of good. And you can sort of hear where, uh, if you know anything about Plato, you know, Plato's forms, that there are higher uh, perfections or forms of things that exist and that everything in this life is a reflection of that. Well, Socrates talked about the form of the good. In other words, what is pure goodness is what he's talking about, apart from any, any manifestation of that in terms of action, that there was goodness, a pure goodness, and it was a love for that pure goodness rather than doing any particular good thing that should be the chief, of, uh, chief aim of education and especially of philosophy. So figuring out that there is an essence of goodness and focusing on that, that really was the basis of Socrates' philosophical approach. He did, Socrates said that virtue, rather that, you know, it had been identified previously as a force or a strength moving in a certain direction. He particularly, Socrates said that virtue was the rational part of the human psyche. Psyche is a Greek word, it means mind uh, or soul. That virtue was the active part of that. Virtue is the part of our mind or souls that gets enacted in the world. And so he begins to get toward virtue and an understanding we would have of it. Okay. Um, he, he believed, Socrates believed that education and ultimately philosophy were the highest forms of good. He was a philosopher, of course. Um, he himself, Socrates, although he was said to be extraordinarily ugly and he was, he was executed, um, he lived a very moral life. He was known for this. He was chaste, disciplined, pious, responsible. He cared for his friends. He was executed for, you know, he challenged the society. He challenged everybody about what they did and why they did it. Apparently, he could be very obnoxious. He cared about his friends, but anybody he thought was going in the wrong direction, he'd call you out. He ended up being so offensive that this is, you have to know something about a particular time post-Golden Age in, uh, in Greece to understand this, but he was executed for um, corrupting the youth because he was, he was questioning the values that existed because he was trying to get to a higher level of value. Now, um, Socrates is one of the first ones that really advocated what we would call virtue ethics by saying that uh, it is doing an evil thing damages your soul. It damages your psyche. It damages your, you know, it, it affects your ability to express virtue. He believed that doing an evil act damaged human beings at their most human part. That's virtue ethics. In other words, don't do things that are going to hurt you. It's about what you become. He also, um, and this is something the Greeks did not understand about Socrates. Socrates argued that it was better to suffer an injustice than to do one. Because he said if you suffer injustice, that's only temporary. But if you do an injustice, if you do evil, you are damaging yourself in a way that you may not be able to recover from. And so you see, he is one who begins to create a kind of virtue ethic that we understand. That's why Socrates is so important on this. Um, well, after Socrates, and again, I should, the Greeks, I said they didn't get it, because the Greeks felt like you, you know, um, as long as you're victorious. Remember, they're coming from a background where most of the people before Socrates were saying, but if you can achieve glory, if you can be a great hero, if you can win the day for yourself and your people, then that's, that's the point. And Socrates comes along and says, no, if you do something that hurts others, you are damaging yourself in a serious way. And so it is not virtuous to, to win the victory if in doing so you have to do something that is not to the good of the people. Um, the, the Greeks did not understand how you could be moral if you did something that was against your own self-interest. They believed that's, that's, what, that's what ethical conduct was, is to gain glory. And he said, no, just winning just gaining something for your own self-interest is not the highest value. In fact, that's damaging to you. So he really created this idea of virtue ethics that we think about. Well, after Socrates, and, and Socrates is reflected in Plato's writings, because remember, Socrates didn't write anything. He was against writing. Plato comes along his student, and he records a lot of Socrates' 
life and also Socrates' teaching. But then, even in the, even in the one uh, writing of Plato, The Republic, the first part of it is about Socrates, and the second part of it, Plato develops his own kind of philosophical approaches, especially ethical approaches. And Plato was really quite different. Plato's eth ethical idea sort of goes back to Homer, this, this Homeric um, conception, that the leader, that, that real ethics, the, the proper ethics, is that a leader of a tribe or a city is successful in running the city well. Okay? That, um, that he is, he achieves victory for himself and for his people. This is going back to Homer. That the main ethical aim is to be a really good leader, whatever that takes. And in that way, Plato was he was going back to the old way of thinking rather than Socrates. That's all I'm really going to say about Plato with regard to ethics. We then come to the most important after Socrates, but based on Socrates, and that is Aristotle. Aristotle wrote the first real treatise on ethics. Remember, we only know about Socrates from what Plato wrote. And, you know, Aristotle referred to him as well. But Aristotle comes along, he, he coins the word ethics, names it as a field of study based upon what he had learned from Socrates and then from Socrates' student Plato, who was his teacher. And for Aristotle, his goal, the goodness, the good life for him, meant to achieve what he called eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, Greek word. It often is translated happiness, but that's not a good translation. You always run into problems when you translate one language from another in terms of catching the subtlety. The word eudaimonia, which is a focal point of Aristotle's ethics, really means well-being, to flourish, to succeed in all things, to be prosperous, and I don't mean just wealthy, I mean to prosper in spirit as well as in material. It's overall success and well-being, to flourish. And that's what Aristotle said a good life was, was to achieve eudaimonia, flourishing. And he identified that in order to accomplish that, there were certain particular virtues that you need to, uh, need to manifest in your life. So he takes Socrates' kind of view of virtue ethics, that it's not just you know, winning glory for yourself and your people, and he begins to apply very specific things. He identifies the virtues of courage, justice, prudence, and temperance as being four of the primary virtues. To be courageous, to uh, reflect justice, to be prudent, which he considered sort of um, the, the expression of wisdom, to have wise judgment. And also temperance, to discipline yourself, to control yourself, not just to not to drink too much, eat too much, but to be temperate in your, in your uh, life. The highest form, he felt, was to pursue an intellectual life. Like Socrates, he thought philosophy was the highest of all calling. But this whole eudaimonia as the good life is the centerpiece around which Aristotle's whole ethic. But around it, he wrote more. He wrote a whole treatise on ethics, and he wrote a lot more after that. So Aristotle's writings about ethics are still considered foundational today, 2,000 years later, 2,000 plus years later, for any understanding of what ethics means. Um, now, again, later on we use the word happiness, and some people think happy means to have a lot of money and be able to get whatever you want. That is not at all what the ethics of Aristotle means. So when they translate uh, eudaimonia in Aristotle as meaning happiness, that takes people in a completely wrong direction. Um, the Aristotle said that while there are certain virtues that we might pursue, like pleasure, honor, understanding, intellectual pursuit, um, courage, they're valuable in their own sake, but the reason they're especially valuable is because they lead to something else. They lead us to eudaimonia. They lead us to a flourishing in our lives. They make us better people. And he said the reason happiness or eudaimonia or flourishing is the highest of all value, that's what you're really shooting for, is because he said that is not a means to some other end, like all these others are. That in itself is the goal. There's nothing beyond that that we're trying to achieve. We don't look for eudaimonia. We don't look for flourishing. We don't look for well-being in order to achieve something else. That's the thing we're trying to achieve, and everything else leads to that. That's why that was the focal point of so much of the study. Lynn? Does this come uh, or relate to our discussion about joy and happiness? That happiness is 
from the world. What we get from the world and joy is what we get from God. It, it's well, that has to do with different understanding of the words. That's why I'm saying that the translation of happiness is the confusing part for us. Right. Often they will translate um, eudaimonia in the Aristotle's use of that word into the word happiness, and it's not for well, happiness in our Western sense is a fairly superficial thing. Okay. That's why I'm wondering if a better translation would be joy. Well, but it's not even joy because... It, it, well, it's contentment, what do you think? Contentment, but, but uh, both joy and contentment are more emotional reactions to it. When he says flourishing, he means excelling in your life. <coughs> he means actually actually manifesting a uh, someone who is... He, he actually uses examples like someone who is a physician. They excel if they're a really good physician and if they practice it. So it's not just their emotional reaction to it, it's actually the experience of flourishing, of well-being, of excellence in their life. So there's a practical kind of part that we don't really capture even in the use of joy. Because joy is, a, is an internal thing. He's talking about this also as reflected in our external life. Carolyn. It sounds sort of like Maslow's self-actualization. Uh, that's, probably, that's probably a good way to see it. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of, of um, needs. needs. The, the lowest one is the basic needs of food and you know oxygen, etc. You know the survival things. And as you work your way up, the highest level in Maslow's uh, needs hierarchy is self-actualization to achieve. And I think that's probably a very good uh, analogy to achieve um, value in your life in terms of feeling as though you're you're maximizing your potential. You're finding satisfaction in the exercise of activities or relationships or whatever it is that you really are living a good life, right? You see how those things are related to one another? Self-actualization, eudaimonia, the word that Aristotle uses, uh, or this self-fulfillment is another way that you might translate uh, uh, eudaimonia. So this really was the focus of his work. Now, uh, Aristotle, his primary book of ethics is called Nico, Nic Nicomachean Ethics. He wrote two volumes of that. He wrote other books on ethics as well. Um, he talks about the fact that someone who has really had that level of fulfillment that he sought me about, he describes them as, as having excellence of character because they know how to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. So there is an active part of it as opposed to joy. There is a sense of actualization gets at that because it means you actually you are doing something with your life that reflects the fact that you've achieved a level of well-being or excellence or satisfaction. Okay? So he had a practical side of it. It wasn't just what you're feeling. There was an external kind of manifestation of this flourishing, this human flourishing. So if you're sitting in a hut somewhere growing all your own food and you're contented, um, that's really not his description because you're not living up to your potential. There's other things maybe you should be doing or to be more fulfilled or to give to the world or like it's that. It's possible you could be doing that because Aristotle, like Socrates, believed that a life of intellectual pursuit was the highest of all goods. That, that to pursue philosophy and a life of thought was the highest level that someone could achieve in terms of fulfillment because rationality, the Greeks believed and others have believed, was the highest of all human functions. And so, yeah, so, yeah I'm, not, I'm not a fan. I guess you could know that. Um, so he, I mean, he emphasized practical wisdom, but ultimately, like Socrates, he believed that the life of the mind was the highest of all things. Now, similar to that, I'll give you another parallel. I know people who, uh, when I've been teaching about history and everything else, and I've talked about people entering monastic life, you know, a life of study and a life of prayer. I've had Protestants say to me, that's such a waste. You know, these people could be doing something really productive with their lives. Well. I don't agree, and, and Aristotle would agree, because the idea is a life of thought and study, and as Christians, we would say, and a life of prayer, of intercession for the world, a life of seeking God as a, as a spiritual as well as an intellectual pursuit. Uh, Aristotle would be the first one to say that's the highest level of achieving human excellence, and that, that the ideal that so few people have an opportunity to is to focus their life on that. Instead, they all have to work for them. You know, they have to worry about how they're going to eat. And that's not the highest achievement. That's, those are just base animal kinds of needs. The Maslow's, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, exactly. 
that, that the, the intellectual life, that sort of thing, to, would be the highest level of self-actualization. So if that person living in a hut somewhere and just growing their own food, if they were do, and if they were satisfied with that, I mean, if it's not something forced on them, if they felt they were doing that because it gave them the freedom to be able to meditate, to, to study, to think higher thoughts, then Aristotle would probably say, right on, that's a good thing. And not many people get that opportunity. Okay? Um, so you begin to see that there is both the internal and an external manifestation. Because he talked about you know, the virtues of courage and prudence and temperance being reflections of this, uh, this internal flourishing. And so there's a, it's neither just mental or intellectual or internal, nor is it just external. Now, in some ways, Aristotle is reflecting Plato, although, again, Plato tended in his ethics to go back to pre-Socratic times. Um, Plato did talk about the four cardinal virtues, which he identified as courage, temperance, justice, and prudence, but he didn't spend a lot of time on them. Aristotle really developed those. Um, and he considered especially courage and temperance as two of the moral, most typical uh, moral <coughs> virtues. He then listed a whole lot of minor virtues that would be reflections of that. And in fact, down to history, that's been the case. I'll, I'm going to talk a few minutes about, for instance, when we get into, um, into some of the religious ethics. Some religions have major virtues. But then if you're, if, like if you buy into being a monk or a nun, there may be hundreds of different virtues that you pledge yourself to try to to follow up on. Okay. I mentioned already that Aristotle, when he talks about these moral issues or the ethical issues, he really developed two versions. He, he created, he coined the phrase politics, meaning an ethical system that is intended to create a virtuous or a flourishing public life, that is for a society or a tribe or whatever group. It's a group ethic, politics. And then ethics is, uh, is the same kind of principles but applied to a private, a personal development. Okay? Um, again, with Aristotle, ethical knowledge is not just internal. There is a practical, it's not theoretical, there's a practical experience that you have to manifest if you have a true and proper um, eudaimonia, a true and proper flourishing and excellence in your life. You need to be taught, you need to practice what he called fine habits to be really good. You have to actually do virtuous things in order to be a, an ethical person. And so he had a very practical kind of uh, outcome from that. And again, Aristotle is still read today as being the foundational documents with regard to any kind of ethical uh, understanding. And Aristotle, although Socrates is kind of, it's pre-Socrates and post-Socrates is how they think about it, uh, Aristotle is the one that took a lot of those same ideas and really expounded on them, developed them, because he wrote treatises uh, in a way that Socrates didn't write anything. And he expanded much more. Aristotle also invented most of our modern concepts about science because he was an observer. You know, Aristotle was a really significant guy. After Aristotle, we have a number of different schools that come along, like the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Hedonists were in there. All of them had different understandings about what the differences are what constitutes a good life. The Epicureans looked for um, the, the quiet enjoyment of pleasures. They were pleasure-oriented. They looked for not only good food, but also mental pleasure, freedom from anxiety, etc. The Hedonists were absolutely more pleasure, less pain kind of thing. Um, and you get the Stoics. The Stoics were not so much focused on pleasure as on reason. What is you know, the, the intellectual life? What is the most reasonable? To a Stoic, even if you experienced pain or unpleasantness in pursuit of reason, that was still good. And I've been hearing your heathness would go, not so much. If it hurts, it's not good. A Stoic would say, if it hurts in the pursuit of the higher values of, of reason or intellectual pursuits, then that's okay. That's still not good. Right? So you have different interpretations of those things. Oh, I didn't even give you this stuff. Sorry. Forget what's behind me. Um, Generally, what Plato and then Aristotle said, I think I gave you that information. All right, I want to move on now, since I didn't mention this before. And let's, we're going to go back 1,600 years or so, depending upon where you draw the line, and talk about Jewish ethics. <coughs> As I said before, the Jews were the founders, or the, I should say, God was the 
we went through the creation of the Jewish faith, the Judaism um, created what's called ethical monotheism. Ethical monotheism means they believed in one God, and that God had told them, here's, here's what you should do, and here's what you should not do. More specifically, here's what you are allowed to and you're not allowed to. The Jewish law, the Old Testament, the Torah, has, or Tanakh, the Torah sometimes is used to refer to the whole of the Hebrew Bible, sometimes it's only the first five books, the books of Moses. Technically, it's the first five books, but they often use it as a generic word for the whole thing. But Tanakh is a reference, is the Jewish reference to all of the, the Old Testament. There are 213, or 613 different commandments. Obviously, we have the Big Ten, you know, the Ten Commandments, but there are 613 different mitzvot, is the Hebrew word for it, or commandments in the Old Testament. Um, the book I have not read, but I would like to, is a Jewish guy, a very modern, secular Jewish guy. He decided that he wanted to spend one year and try to follow all the commandments in the Old Testament, so far as he could without breaking the, the law. It's called A Year of Living Biblically. He wrote a book about it. Um, and so far as he, as he could, without, you know, he obviously he couldn't stone somebody for heresy or something like that. <laughs> but as far as he could, he wanted to spend one year as a Jewish man living according to the, to the Hebrew Bible. And so I haven't read the book, but it, the reviews I've read are fascinating. And, and he has a very lighthearted kind of approach to it, apparently. Um, so, Jewish ethics predates the people we've just been talking about. It predates the Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Again, uh, Socrates died in 399 BC, so 400 years before Jesus. That's the same time that the last of the Hebrew prophets, Malachi, was right. So all of Jewish ethics, whether you want to start with Abraham and the things that God told Abraham to do, or more specifically Moses, five, came 500 years later, around 1500. Moses was given instructions about, you know, here's the law. He, Moses was the lawgiver. God spoke to him to give all of the commandments, the uh, Ten Commandments and the others. And then later on, those were expanded on by the various prophets and the wisdom writings, etc. Um, and so, all of that came a long time before the Greek influence. But, once the Greeks come along, they greatly influenced the way the Jews interpreted the Hebrew law. In fact, the Jewish ethics from the time of Aristotle, or from the time of Alexander the Great on, so we're talking the 3rd century BC, was very much a combination of Jewish deontology, the ethical um, duty that came from the Hebrew law, and much more the virtue ethics that came from the Greek scholars. It was very much a combination of those two things in any sort of modern Jewish ethics. In fact, there are several sources we can look to as um, for Jewish ethics. And by the way, just, I mean to take that out. Uh, the first line should be written, just written Hebrew Bible, because the, the oral comes under the halakha. The, the Jewish ethics are based upon first the Torah, or the Tanakh, which are the Hebrew Bible. That's the same content that we have in our Old Testament. The only difference between the Hebrew Bible and our Old Testament is it's in a different order, and it's broken up differently. It looks like we have a lot more books, but that's because we break them up differently. We have 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel. That's one, each of those is one book. We have Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book in the Hebrew Bible. And we have the 12 minor prophets. In the Hebrew Bible, it's the book of the 12, and they're all put together. So they have 24 books in their Old Testament. We have 39, but it's the same content. It's in a different order. Chronicles is the last, uh, it's the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So, um, but same content. So we have the same basis. That is the Tanakh, um, which is the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh because it's a combination of three words. Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim, which is the law, or the instruction, the law, the prophets, and the writings. You take Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim, and you cut off the front of them and put those three, three pieces together, you get Tanakh. Tanakh is the common name that Jews use for the Hebrew Bible. So that's the written Hebrew Bible. That is the most basic of documents for them. But then you have the Halakha. The Halakha are the, the commentary, sometimes referred to as the oral law. It is the Talmud, which is the Mishnah, the Gemara, other writings that came later, which are usually commentary on the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it is the thing that is taught in Hebrew schools, etc. If you ever watch Yentl and they're sitting there arguing, you know, Rabbi Akiva said, that the day begins when you can first see a shadow. No, but Rabbi Hillel said that it begins with 
Well, those are all writings that are in, are, are in the Talmud, which are commentaries. The Talmud is much longer than the Hebrew Bible, and it really was the oral, uh, it's sometimes called the oral Torah, which is why I said they written an oral and then I, I, I failed to change that when I did the rest of the slide. Um, it was seen as being secondary, but still critically important, still very valuable in the Hebrew understanding of God's instruction to us. And for a long time it was oral, it wasn't written down, and then after, you know, after the, um, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in, in 70 AD, etc., they started saying, you know, if we don't write this stuff down, we're liable to lose it. And so they started writing it down, and we have, much later, we have the writings that make up the Talmud, okay? And other rabbinic literature. So that's the Halakha. They are um, religious writings, literature, especially legal in their orientation, legal interpretation. But at the same time, yes? Going back a little bit, is, are uh, Torah and Tanakh synonyms? Well, they can be. Torah, which the word means law, or uh, that's, that's usually interpreted law, it actually means instruction, because it's not law like we think of the law. You know, like, okay, you can't go over 55 miles an hour or whatever. It's much more instruction. Now, technically, the Torah are the first five books of the Old Testament, the books written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, technically. But because those are seen as so important and so, so much the pinnacle, I mean, all Jews everywhere have always accepted those five. Some Jews have said the rest of it's not so important. But sometimes they will use the word Torah to refer to all of the, the Hebrew Bible. So it can be generically used for all of it. <laughs> Technically, it only means the first five books. Tanakh refers to the whole Hebrew Bible. And in fact, as I said, the, the acronym, do you call it an acronym if it's more than one letter from each one? I don't know. But it's a combination of letters. The first part of that it starts with a T because the first part is the Torah. Torah, Nebaim, Keduvi, the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. Together, they call it the Tanakh. Right? Does that make sense? Um, Along with those, the, the written Hebrew scripture and the halakha, the oral tradition that was written down in the Talmud, you then get the influence of Greek ethics. Now this especially comes in the Middle Ages. Maimonides is considered perhaps the greatest Hebrew scholar ever. Maimonides in the 12th century did a Jewish commentary, a Jewish interpretation of Aristotle's um, Nicomachean ethics. So he reinterpreted Aristotle, that we just talked about, Aristotle's ethics, in light of Jewish law. That gives you an idea, now prior to that, the, the Greek influence had already been very great on Jewish thinking and Jewish, Jewish uh, understanding of the law and their ethics. But it became such that the greatest of the scholars in the Jewish faith were actually actively combining Greek philosophy and ethics with Jewish ethical law and writing treatises on that. Um, in return, following that, I'll mention and then we'll talk about modern, Maimonides writing, or Rambam, as he's sometimes called, uh, Rabbi, his whole name, um, in the 12th century, he greatly influenced Thomas Aquinas, which is the greatest of the Catholic theologians. Thomas Aquinas then developed um, what's called the natural law tradition of Christian theology, which was, is, was and is the basis for Catholic interpretation of ethical law. So Maimonides, the Jew, writes a commentary on the Greek philosopher Aristotle's ethics. And that becomes very influential on Thomas Aquinas, who is the primary ethical, well, theologian, but the primary ethical theologian, among other things, for the Catholic Church. Okay, so you begin to see how these influences go on. I'm not going to get a lot into the Christian part of it today, because we're going to deal with that later. Um, so you get various other writings that come through the Middle Ages, the Halakha, the legal writings, the commentary that I talked about here, the Talmud and then other writings as well. Um, a lot of that happened in the Middle Ages. So they were taking into account, as Maimonides did, there are other writers who take into account various Greek ethical themes along with Jewish law and combine those into things. When you get into a more modern period, a lot of Jewish ethics begins to be sprouted off as they get different Jewish offshoots. Confirm, conform, or I'm sorry, Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, you know, etc. Each of them has sort of a, depending on how liberal they are, how strictly they read the Tanakh, which of the ancient uh, Jewish writers they focus on, they will have different kinds of ethical guidance in their writing. Now, um, 
some of the major themes that come out in the Jewish writing, and again, we're talking about all this because this is the foundation for Christian ethics. This is where it starts. The Jewish ethics of the Old Testament plus Jesus and those who interpreted Jesus, like Paul, give us Christian ethics. That's why we're talking about this. Uh, and the Jewish ethics was greatly influenced. Jewish ethics by, by the time of Maimonides, by the Middle Ages, was a combination of Jewish law and Greek ethics. So that's why we're dealing with all that. But in the middle, in, in, in terms of major themes in biblical ethics, it's always been true. Some people who never bothered to read it will say, well, the, the Old Testament is all about law and justice and judging and God is angry, etc. Horse hockey. That's not the case. Uh, the Old Testament, while there is judgment, because the Jews demanded it, I mean, they kept doing things that had, they had to be judged for, it is a book about God's grace and God's mercy. And if you read the Old Testament, it, the, the prophets of the Old Testament exhort people to lead a righteous and compassionate life. It talks about kindness to the needy, benevolence to all, about having faith and expressing it in how you live your life, about compassion for the suffering, peace-loving disposition, having a true and humble, contrite spirit, all of those are ethical issues. And they are ethical issues having to do with virtues, not just law. How should we live as kindly persons? Um, it even deals with things like civic loyalty. How are we, how are we to be good citizens? So all of the major um, scholars of Jewish history have written some or, you know, some interpretation of ethics. Jewish ethics, most of them influenced by Greek philosophy as well. Hillel, who you may have heard of, Hillel the Elder, he formulated a version of the Golden Rule, which is the negative version. Whatever is hateful to you, do not do unto others. Okay, remember, there's a positive Golden Rule that Jesus said, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Then the negative version, don't do to other people what you don't want them to do to you. Well, uh, Rabbi Hillel dealt with those things. Rabbi Akiva, or Akiva, who was a second century rabbi, uh, does a version of the Golden Rule. He says, whatever you hate to have done to you, do not do to your neighbor. Therefore, uh, do not hurt him, do not speak ill of him, do not reveal his secrets to others. Let his honor and his property be as dear to you as your own. These are, you know, these are all based upon Old Testament Jewish law ethics, the prophets, as well as the influence of the Greek stuff. The, um, uh, Rabbi Akiva also focused a lot on the commandments, which Jesus said the greatest commandment was love God above all else, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The second is likened to it, right up there next to it. Rabbi Akiva talked a lot about loving your neighbor as yourself as the greatest fundamental commandment. It's interesting, another great rabbi in history, Rabbi uh, Shimlai, taught, he, he said, 613 commandments were given to Moses. That's the mitzvah, the commandments. There are 613 Old Testament commandments. So, uh, similar I taught. 613 commandments were given to Moses. Then David came and reduced them to 11 in Psalm 15. Isaiah, Isaiah 33, 15, cut them to 6. Micah 6, 8, the prophet Micah, cuts them to 3. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. You notice none of those are legalistic. This is the Old Testament. Then Isaiah again, in Isaiah 56, 1, reduced it to two. Maintain justice and do what is right. And then Habakkuk, according to Rabbi Sinai, in two, Habakkuk 2, 4, says there's only one ultimate uh, requirement or commandment. The righteous person lives by his faithfulness. Be true to what God has told you to be. Okay? Be faithful to God and obedient in that. So, you see, there's a lot of different ways to interpret the Jewish, um, the Jewish ideals of ethics in the Old Testament. It's not just all about the law. There's a lot more to that. Because you take even 613 commandments, you run into situations as to how do I apply this? And so that's why the Jews brought in some of the Greek understanding of how ethics works and principles of ethics, like the, virtuous, the virtue ethics, in order to try to figure that out. Now, Consistent with the Old Testament and consistent with the training they received in Greek, there are a number of different major focuses. Rabbi Simeon bin Gamaliel, you guys know the name Gamaliel? Gamaliel is in the New Testament. He is in the book of Acts. He was the teacher of Paul the Apostle. And he was one of the greatest of all, he was actually a student of Hillel, and one of the greatest of all the, the um, Jewish scholars down through history. Well, he taught the world rests on three things, justice, truth, and peace. 
Now that's an ethic. That's an ethical standard. Uh, justice, he interpreted as being that uh, God desires that we be just. That God's justice be vindicated, whether it's in large things or small things. That prevents us from stealing or oppressing, from even holding back overnight, just even overnight, um, Gamaliel wrote, the hired man's earnings. You don't keep the money if you owe it to them. All of those have to do with issues of justice. Justice isn't just sending somebody to prison or not. It has to do with all of your dealings every day. The second, truth. Gamaliel wrote, and this is all in Talmudic writings, that falsehood, flattery, perjury, and false witness are all forbidden. Any untruth, that means that you cannot have a, dispos uh, a disposition that is revengeful, that is uh, um, taking revenge on someone, you have to revere old age, justice has to be done in a true way, Truth means that if you're a merchant, that your weights and measurements have to be accurate. You can't cheat on that. And that when a judge is making a decision, he can't base it on whether somebody's rich or poor. All of these are issues of both justice and truth. And then peace, probably the strongest. The word shalom in the Hebrew Bible. That has always been interpreted as one of the most important underlying principles of the Torah, of the Hebrew law or instruction. Um, the Talmud interprets Proverbs 3.17, which Proverbs 3.17 says, In the Torah, her ways are pleasant ways, all her paths are shalom, are peace. Well, the Talmud says the entire Torah is for the sake of shalom. It is for the sake of peace. All the way, talked a lot about peace, about shalom being the focus of the whole Torah. You boil it all down, it's about peace. Also, we have in the, the Talmud writings, a focus on the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed means loving kindness. So loving kindness, compassion. Um, in fact, Simeon the Just, one of the Talmudic writers, says that the war rests on three things. The Togah, the law of God. Second, service to God. And third, the showing of chesed, the showing of loving kindness. One of the core ethical values of the Hebrew law is loving kindness. Now, all of these things taken together reflect how we're supposed to treat other people, but interesting in Jewish ethics, it also is very clear in how you treat yourself. Um, the Jewish sources make great emphasis on the fact that a man uh, or a woman are duty-bound to preserve their own life and their health. In fact, some of the Talmudic writers say that the foods that are dangerous to your health should be more guarded against than those that are ritually forbidden in the law. Okay. Obviously, you know that there is a dietary law in the Old Testament. You don't eat pork, you don't eat shellfish, you know, there's a lot of stuff you might love to eat. You don't eat, you know, meat and milk together. Those are the kosher laws. But in the Talmud, they say even more important than following the dietary law in the, in the law of the Old Testament is stay away from things that are going to hurt you in terms of food. Um, Jewish ethics says that self-abasement, denying yourself, that's why there's no asceticism in Judaism. There's no you know, denying yourself thinking you're going to gain greater spiritual ideas. Um, the, the Talmud says, and I quote, He who subjects himself to needless self-castigations and fasting, or even denies himself the enjoyment of wine, is a sinner. <laughs> My wife guests. Okay? Um, a person needs to show respect for their own body as much as they do other people's body, because we are, in doing so we're honoring the image of God. Of course, the New Testament talks about the fact that our body, Paul says, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to treat it well. That's consistent with Old Testament idea. That um, according to Judaism, real life goes beyond just breathing and having blood flowing through our veins. It also means existing in the presence of others, in the presence of God, and caring for ourselves so that we can then express care for other people. Right? All that is part of a Jewish ethic. For the last few minutes, let me talk briefly about modern morality. In the modern times, there is an ever-increasing emphasis, and has been, on moral action rather than the more traditional focus on moral agent. Remember, I talked about that earlier. The more ancient <coughs> documents, like the Greeks, had to do with the person and what would happen to the person. More and more and more, we have begun to focus on the action and the results of the action in a larger sense, not just on us, 
as I said, modern thinkers, whereas ancient thinkers were almost all uh, virtue ethicists. They all had to do with what will happen to me. Aristotle said, you damage your own soul when you do an evil. Okay. Um, the two groups, consequentialists, who deal with what are the consequences of my actions, and make ethical decisions based on that, or the deontologists who say, I have, there are rules we have to follow. Um, those are the two modern ethics that have been dominant, and they are both based upon action rather than agent. Okay? In the Middle Ages, I referred to this already, a natural law ethics comes along. Uh, Maimonides and other writers influenced Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas is the greatest of all Catholic theologians. And he developed a synthesis of biblical ethics and Aristotelian ethics. Bible, Greek. He put them together and created what became known as natural law theory. Natural law theory says, the, the premise behind it is that um, our ethical decisions are based upon the nature of human beings. Any action that would deny something that is fundamental to human beings is forbidden. Anything that would advance the necessity or requirements of human beings is approved. Um, for instance, education is a major focus because human beings need education in order to achieve their goals. Murder is wrong because murder denies life and life is essential to human beings. The, many of the doctrines, now, now Thomas Aquinas became the theologian of the Catholic Church, both in his day and subsequent to that. There's a great little biography of him called The Dumb Ox by, uh, by G.K. Chesterton if you want to find out more about Aquinas. There's a lot of writing about Aquinas, but The Dumb Ox is my favorite. This natural law theory that Aquinas developed, a combination of biblical ethics and of Aristotelian ethics, is still the basis of Catholic moral teaching. Um, the view of the Catholic Church on issues like contraception and abortion and other moral issues is based upon Aquinas' natural law theory. Contraception, you know, the denying of the birth of children when you're committing an act that's, that the Catholic Church believes is supposed to leave that is a denial of a human, of an appropriate human result. And so there it gets contraception. All of it's based upon the natural law. Now, in fact, the Catholic Church took Aquinas' natural law theory and developed it into literally handbooks or manuals of moral guidance. <laughs> This is a system called casuistry. Now, to some people, in fact, if you look up that definition, it, it may say, you know, verbally just trying to justify yourself. But that's not really what it means. Casuistry is the application of ethical principles to specific cases of ethics or conscience. And the ethical principles that they apply to various circumstances, it's like they go through, this is the ultimate applied ethics. They use natural law theology that Aquinas developed based on Bible and Aristotelian ethics. And they have manuals, they have books that say, here's how this applies to these situations, okay? And so that's very much the way the Catholic Church works now. Okay, I'm not doing that. Um, so casuistry is, is taking natural law theory and applying it to all sorts of different ethical questions. And that's the way, that's the Catholic Church's approach to it. And that's why they're so adamant about things, is because they, they've already thought about all this stuff and said, here's how we deal with it. The only questions that really seriously come up are very modern questions, like uh, how do you deal with, with in vitro fertilization or cloning or any of those kinds of things. Obviously, the in Middle Ages, they didn't come up with instructions on how to deal with that. We then come to the other person besides Socrates that I said, modern, modern uh, philosophy is divided between pre-Kant and post-Kant. Kant was very German. Kant said that duty is what is important. We all have a duty that we have to fulfill. And we all inside basically know what that is. In fact, Kant talked about that the things that we must do ethically are the things that we know are the right things. He called those categorical imperatives. A categorical imperative is a command that of its very nature must be obeyed. Very regimented, very duty oriented. And so Kant developed a whole ethic around the idea that there are certain things that you know you want to do. There are basic inherent uh, duties that you have that are reflected in the in standards. And we all understand those things. There really isn't any, any 
any way to argue against it unless you're just being selfish. He said that the thing, the way we evaluate whether something is an appropriate duty or a categorical imperative is the principle of universal, universalizability, meaning, is this something everyone should adopt? And if so, it is a categorical imperative. Categorical imperative. Okay? Now, um, in doing that, Kant's philosophy really made a huge shift toward um, the, the deontological. Prior to that, everything had been virtue ethics, and then in terms of Catholic natural law theology, since it had to do with what is helpful to humans, it's very much consequentialist oriented, right? What are the consequences of this with regard to does it support or deny human, human needs? Kant comes along and introduces in a huge way the idea that we have duties, there are rules, categorical imperatives, we all have to obey. So he really pushed the uh, the idea of deontology, there, there's a duty, there are laws. We then run into, in the 19th century, in Britain, it's a version of consequentialism called utilitarianism. Particularly John Stuart Mill, as a name you may have heard, and Jeremy Bentham, they advocated that any ethical action should be based upon what produces the most good for the most people. That's utilitarianism. What produces the most good for the most people? If it requires self-sacrifice, for instance, the, the question I gave you all last week where we talked about ethical things, the fat man can not You know, if, if there is a train barreling down on, a subway train barreling down on five children, and there is one old fat guy who clearly is not in good health and probably isn't going to last very long, if you knew that pushing that fat man in front of that train would stop the train and save the lives of those five children, would you do it? Now, if you believe that there's absolute categorical imperatives that you don't kill anybody ever, then you would say no. But if you're a utilitarian and you say saving five children by sacrificing one old fat guy who's not healthy, that's a utilitarian approach would be to say absolutely, because the most good to the most people would be to save five children at the expense of one old guy. Would it also be virtue because of what it would do to you to kill somebody? Well, that's a question. Yeah, virtue ethics would, would be another factor you'd have to consider. But the utilitarian approach, um, which is a version of consequentialism, would say, oh, sacrifice the one, you know. I, I mentioned to you that in the, when Spock died in the Star Trek movies, you know, he's radiation and everything, he's behind the, you know, and in, in and Kirk is really upset, and Spock says, you know, um, the life of the one, uh, the life of the many uh, is more important. Outweigh. Oh, outweigh. That? outweigh. That's the word I was looking for. The, the life of the, of the many outweigh, and the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one or the few. And that's why he sacrificed himself. That's a utilitarian approach, which is a kind of consequentialism. Then we get to the 20th century. Um, and in the early 20th century, there was a big focus on the philosophy. It's like we, we, we weren't nearly as smart as we thought we were. And so they're all focusing on, is there really any such thing as morality? Where does it come from? All of these big philosophical questions and very little emphasis on how do you decide what's right and wrong. It's almost as though for the first half of the 20th century up until the Second World War, we thought we were past that. Now the First World War threw Europe on their ear. Uh, to a great extent, but when we get to the Second World War, all of a sudden, the issues became very practical and applied ethics. For instance, the Holocaust. How do you do? There's a whole, uh, whole discipline of ethical writing related to the Holocaust. Um, there had been in 1948 there was a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which primarily was a response to the Holocaust and the atrocities of the Second World War. Um, we began to have sort of existential reflections on the meaning of life, which we had not really done prior to that. Well, the First World War was a horrible thing and destroyed a whole generation of European uh, young men. There were not, there were not really the ethical, uh, they, they dealt with things like, is it okay to use gas, you know, the, you know, is it wrong to use gas, and they passed some rules about that. But there was not nearly the radical ethical, that the, the raw evil that we saw expressed in the Second World War was a very different thing. It wasn't a political evil so much as it was just a human moral evil that we saw manifest. And so there was a very different kind of approach, second or middle of the 20th century on, um, Second World War and later. There was a revival of the casuistry. How do we apply our ethical principles to specific circumstances? What do we do about that? So that there was an increase in applied ethics. This is especially from the 1970s on. Casuistry is specific to Catholic. 
right? No, it's, it's a it's, the Catholics are the ones that followed it originally, but it's a principle uh, that, that can be applied anywhere, where you take ethical principles and you make specific decisions about how to apply them. It is, it is, it is a uh, sort of a written down version of applied ethics. Applied ethics can be, can be for everybody. Especially as U.S. history is started to be applied because we run into a lot of new ethical issues that had not existed before. For instance, bioethics. How do we decide about cloning? About you know about in vitro fertilization, etc. Um, about someone carrying a baby that's somebody else's and bringing it to term. Uh, business ethics. Just because we can make a lot of money at somebody else's expense, what what are the ethics behind that? Environmental ethics. If we destroy our planet in order to make a lot of money, where are the lines there? A lot of other very specialized kinds of fields uh, related to that. I've already gone over, so I'm going to deal with religious ethics next week as, a, as an introduction when we start talking, before we start talking about the political ethics.